On Tuesday, a disturbed young man opened fire at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. 19 children and two adults were killed. The shooter was killed on the scene by law enforcement officials. The shooter barricaded himself inside a classroom when, in the words of Texas Lieutenant Christopher Olivares, he, quote, started shooting children and teachers having no regard for human life. On Tuesday, the shooter entered Robb Elementary at around 11.32 a.m. local time after shooting his grandmother in the face and crashing his vehicle near the school. Then he entered the school and fired at anyone and everyone in his path. The shooter, who was wearing body armor, exchanged fire with law enforcement officials and multiple officers were shot. The shooter was eventually shot on the scene, it also turns out. That Customs and Border Protection agents were among the members of law enforcement that exchanged gunfire with the shooter. One of them was shot in the head. He's been hospitalized and is in stable condition. You'll notice I've gone out of my way, not to mention by name, just the shooter. I also don't want to show his face. I don't want to give him any more attention than he already has, which is more than enough already. This was, this is an unspeakable tragedy. Innocent young children, teachers, we mourn every single life lost on Tuesday, and our hearts and souls go out to every parent and every child. These words, I've told you, these were the only words that should have been uttered by the media in the hours and the days after this horrific massacre. These are the only sentiments that should have been uttered. These facts, the shock, the sorrow, the victims, the heroic actions by a Border Patrol cop, but that's not what happened. The next 24 hours became a leftist political roadshow, a pathetic parade of self-importance and, quite frankly, a shocking and yet predictable portrayal of the left, of a left that continues to slide down into the abyss, quickly towards completely losing the plot. What happened in the next 24 hours after the mass shooting, less than 24 hours actually, is something the left cannot and should not be forgiven for, and they don't even show an ounce of shame. Failed politician Robert Francis, a.k.a. Beto O'Rourke, pulled an astonishing little stunt on Wednesday that should end his pol political career and ambitions once and for all. Beto already lost once to Senator Ted Cruz, and now he's running for governor against incumbent Greg Abbott. And yesterday, Beto erected himself as a shining beacon of a party that has absolutely no clue, no class, and again, no shame. Governor Abbott, together with a variety of state and local officials, held a press conference to update the public on the Uvalde massacre at Robb Elementary School. It was a governing moment, not a campaign event. And after the governor had spoken for a couple of minutes, Beto stood up, interrupted, and pointed a finger at the governor. Sir. Right now, you're doing nothing. No, you need to get out of here. This isn't a place to talk to this over. This is totally predictable when you. Sir, you're out of line. Sir, you're out of line. Sir, you're out of line. Please leave this auditorium. I can't believe you're a sick son of a. It would come to a deal like this to make a political issue. It's on like you. Why don't you get out of here? And more. Trailing in the polls and on his path to losing once again, Beto's desperate move was one of, the ma of a man who figures he had to take a risk, nothing to lose, so to speak. And he did so by politicizing the murders of 19 children less than 24 hours after it happened, even as emotions are raw and officials are still trying to figure out the full breadth of the shooter's motivations. Beto once famously said, famously said during his short-lived 2020 presidential campaign that he wanted to ban AR-15 rifles. Well, on Wednesday, he got his new little soundbite, I guess. This fall, we'll see if Texans agree that this mass murder was all about gun control. But that's not the conversation we should be having in the hours after such a tragedy. And yet the left insists on making that, as usual. Steve Kerr, winning NBA coach, used the moment to admonish GOP senators for not passing gun background check laws. There's 50 senators right now who refuse to vote on H.R. 8, which is a background check rule that the House passed a couple of years ago. It's been sitting there for two years. And there's a reason they won't vote on it, to hold on to power. So I ask you, Mitch McConnell, I ask all of you senators who refuse to do anything about the violence and school shootings and supermarket shootings, I ask you, are you going to put your own 
desire for power ahead of the lives of our children and our elderly and our mm. churchgoers, because that's what it looks mm. like. Mm. That was Steve Kerr the, just a, a little while ago. Steve Kerr right there. And now the left calls for Steve Kerr to run for president because he said some stuff. Typical. Well, if Kerr wants to talk about legislation, something he really doesn't know much about, if anything, by the way, then let's talk about legislation, shall we, Steve? Back in June 2020, at the height of the riots after the murder of George Floyd, a defund the police march, habitual drive-by publicity seeker Steve Kerr joined forces with Oakland students and parents who called for the district to remove police officers from schools. I'm here really for, for one reason, and that's because these last couple of weeks especially, but over the past few years, uh, I think there's been a real reckoning for much of America, especially for white America, that we have to reimagine the way black communities are, are living. Mm, got it. After Steve Kerr's speech, the district voted unanimously to remove officers from Oakland schools. And why? Why did they choose to put the safety of children and teachers lower on the list of priorities? Well, another knee-jerk, inappropriate reaction to the death of George Floyd, of course. And just like the fires set to the streets of America, this was a reaction that did absolutely nothing to rectify the divide in America, only served to stoke the fire while harming our kids in the process. Another example of how an agenda fired up by the left creates policy, policy that hurts Americans and worse, hurts our children. And the left didn't stop there. They took it national. In July 2020, Senators Chris Murphy and Elizabeth Warren and Squadsters Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and Elon Omar, they banded together to introduce the, quote, Counseling Not Criminalization in Schools Act that would prohibit federal money to be used to fund police in schools. Well, let me ask them this question. We defend our president with guns, our congressmen and women with guns, including the ones I just mentioned, defended with guns, our courthouses, our sporting events, our jewelry stores, our banks, our money are all defended with guns. Why aren't we defending our children the same way? Why is that a gun-free zone? I suppose guns are just fine to protect our senators and congressmen and women, but not our children. Think about that for a minute. But of course, now the left will come after the National Rifle Association, another part of the left's usual post-mass shooting modus operandi, high up on their menu of go-tos in the coming after the Second Amendment, and the NRA. But why does the NRA have a thing to do with that shooting? Chicago has shootings every single day, and the NRA, never mentioned there, has Steve Kerr, who, by the way, played NBA basketball, for the Bulls in this city of Chicago for years, has Steve Kerr ever said anything about the rampant ongoing violence in Chicago? And while we're at it, while Steve is busy winning so many championships, coaching the Golden State Warriors and earning millions of dollars with the NBA, congratulations, by the way, Steve-O, that's some fine work there. Is Steve also concerned that the NBA partners with a country that commits genocide and human rights atrocities on a daily basis? Hmm. A little quiet there, Steve. And Barack Obama, mm, the man who was president for eight years plus and who is now the de facto president once again, actually used the day after to mark the murder of George Floyd. Read this tweet, folks. I'm quoting. As we grieve the children of Uvalde today, we should take time to recognize that two years have passed since the murder of George Floyd under the knee of a police officer. Can you believe that? I can't believe that. This man had the nerve to bring up George Floyd in the same tweet as the innocent children who were killed the day before. Barack Obama used the mass murder of children to remind us of the anniversary of George Floyd's murder by a police officer. Are you kidding me? Leave it to the former president to demonize his political opponents in the wake of an act of madness and note his default to action, any kind of action. Anything apparently will do as long as it offers self-satisfaction that we're doing something, even if it turns out to be futile or counterproductive or insulting like that tweet. During the Barack Obama's presidencies, our country endured 24 mass shootings, 
more than the three previous administrations combined. And more than any previous administration, Obama and his cabinet had a clear playbook for responding to shootings, always commenting and issuing statements and always making it political. And with the Obama presidency, reactions to shootings grew more politically charged. The left has no shame. And why should they, though? when the proverbial king of their party behaves this way. This is the party of division. This is the party of hurling unjustified political blame. And this is the party of a complete lack of self-awareness again and again. The guns are the distraction from the left's inability to understand the harm their policies and agenda and rhetoric have done to our country. This is just a rehearsed and played out notion, part of the useless and highly politically charged must do somethingism of the left. Do we blame the existence of fighter jets and tanks for wars? No. Why does the left blame guns for mass shootings? The massacre at Robb Elementary School has produced the usual demands to do something. We share the impulse here, the balance and, and the anger, but specifically to do what? But the reason there are more demands than solutions is because the problem of how to stop mass shootings by disturbed young men is one of the hardest in a democratic society. The profile emerging of the shooter is depressingly familiar. A teenage loner with a disruptive family life, bullied as a child because of a speech impediment, immersed in video games and all other virtual reality as well. He fought with his mother. He hinted at violent ambitions. The profile is achingly similar to the profile of other young mass killers, from Sandy Hook to Aurora to Parkland to Tucson to Virginia Tech and Buffalo. They suffer from some mental illness or profound social alienation. Our challenge as a society, as a country, is anticipating when such a young man, and it's nearly always a young man, will snap, and how and when to deny him access to firearms. Not an easy answer. Barack Obama summed up the single-minded response of leftist progressives tweeting that, quote, nearly 10 years after Sandy Hook and 10 days after Buffalo, our country is paralyzed, not by fear, but by a gun lobby and a political party that have shown no willingness to act in any way that might help prevent these tragedies. Remember Sandy Hook? Well, that happened under Barack Obama. Why didn't he then, as president, actually do something, do something, to secure schools from mass shooters since that atrocity happened in 2012? Democrats don't actually want to solve the issue of school shootings. They want to weaponize these shootings to push gun control or even do away with guns altogether. We aren't opposed to sensible gun regulations here, if it's politically possible and might prevent killings. So-called red flag laws that give police the ability to deny guns to people who may pose a risk to the community have been useful in some cases. But they're hard to enforce, as we recently learned in Buffalo. New York State has a red flag statute, and the shooter there was even referred to for mental counseling. He still got a gun. Would background checks beyond those that already exist help? Seems unlikely, since these young men rarely have a criminal record. A six-day waiting period to receive a gun after it's purchased? Not for someone who's determined to kill? I don't know. A ban on purchasing a rifle until the age of 21? As Governor Greg Abbott pointed out astutely Wednesday, 18-year-olds have been able to buy long guns in Texas for more than 60 years. And yet, for decades, mass shootings were rare. The string of mass shootings suggests a deeper issue than gun laws can fix. For example, firearm laws were few and weak before the 70s, yet only in recent decades have young men entered schools and supermarkets for the purpose of killing the innocent. I think there's something closer to a larger social and cultural breakdown happening here. But here's what won't solve this problem. The left pointing a depraved political finger at the Republican Party and for what? For supporting a constitutional right? What does that have to do with a sick young man who slips through the cracks and goes on a killing spree? Here's another thing that won't solve the problem. Joe Biden awkwardly building a ghost gun on the White House front lawn. How does that help, Joe? Wow. Political stunts be damned. We need to take a collective breath as a country and examine the actual pattern and what's really behind these acts of madness. Right now, families are mourning. Right now, our nation is mourning, and right now, the left won't let us mourn. Right now, the left won't let those families weep in peace. On Tuesday, a shooter did something awful, unspeakable, tragic. 21 souls are dead. Right now, 
we mourn them and grieve with them and their families. And that's all we should say and do.